Hello everyone and welcome to this Data Science in the News webinar convened by the QUT Centre for Data Science and the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. So I'm Carrie Mangerson, Distinguished Professor of Statistics and Director of the Centre for Data Science and I'm your moderator for today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Turrbal and Yuggera as the First Nations owners of the land where QUT now stands and also acknowledge the, trust, the traditional custodians of the country from where you're joining us today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. So this series is touches on the role of data and the way that data shapes our decisions in topical issues of the day. And of course, one of the issues right now is the federal elections. So in our world today, we have access to a universe of data on all sorts of topics from all sorts of sources. Never have we seen data play such a role in the elections as now. But fact check, what data do we have access to? What data is being used and how? And what role does data play in elections such as the current one? The pervasiveness of data in all aspects of our lives, including elections, is only going to increase. And so it's important to have discussions about how data is being used, how it's being misused, and what we as intelligent, interested members of society should look for when we try to use these data to make important decisions, such as who to choose to lead our country. So today we're going to have this discussion with four amazing panelists. We have Casey Briggs, data analyst or self-professed numbers gremlin and journalist at the ABC. We have Mark Locks, associate professor in organized crime at QUT. We have Daniel Angus, professor of digital communication at QUT and Misha Ketch, editor at The Conversation. What a lineup. We're going to ask each panel member to, in turn to speak to the topic of the power of data in the 2022 Australian election for about five minutes. And then we'll follow this with a group discussion. So if you have any questions for the panel members, please put them in the chat and time permitting, we can include these in the discussion. But before we start, Mark, can you tell us in two minutes, how does our election system work and why are we here? Well, we're voting this time for the federal government and not the state government and not your local government. And this could be quite confusing sometimes, especially in relation to issues because the average person doesn't actually know the demarcation line between the different levels of responsibility. But we're voting twice. Queenslanders usually vote for one house, but now we're voting for two. We're voting for the Senate and we're, um, and we're voting for the House of Representatives. Now, as a House of Representatives vote, we vote for one person in our local electorate. In the Senate, we're voting effectively um, for one person or one group of people who will be selected as a proportion of the whole state. And we're only voting for half of the Senate this time because we don't actually spill everybody all the time in the Senate. So you'll have two different types of votes. They're both preferential you always have to give your preferences. But in the Senate, because uh, you know the paper could be literally two metres long, you have the option of voting above the line and taking the preferences as listed by one of the parties, or you can spend 45 minutes individually marking the numbers as you wish. So um, it's a very interesting way to vote. It's a very unique way. And Australia was the leader of all the most innovative types of voting in the world, including secret voting. Thanks, Mark. That was amazing. Um, within two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Casey to kickstart our discussions. And Casey Briggs um, is going to talk about data on the cam campaign trail. So Casey's a data analyst, reporter and presenter for the ABC News, and is heavily involved with the network's elections coverage. So he's going to share his perspective on what he's seeing during this year's campaign and discuss the role that data is now playing in it. Over to you, Casey. Thanks, and, and thanks everyone for um, having me. Yes, yeah, so as you say, I'm a, a data reporter, data analyst at, at ABC News, and I guess my role with elections is twofold. One, 
as we, you know, we're only, what, 15 days from polling day um, today. We are furiously getting all of the, the infrastructure and the machinery in place to cover this, you know, the results of this election on election night itself. Uh, which is quite a, a big undertaking and probably the most important um, use of data. Well, definitely the most important use of data when it comes to an election is actually understanding what, you know, the true view of the voters is. So that's sort of one piece of my role. But the, the, the during the campaign itself, I've sort of set myself this rather frustrating challenge of trying to find and gather and collect and use as much data as we can to as best explain how this campaign is playing out um, as possible, and I say it's quite frustrating because you know the, the the national campaigns run by political parties are very secretive. They don't want um, you know they don't want uh, their opponents understanding their strategy. They don't want um, you know they don't tell the media where they're going. You know there are journalists on the bus that take off on a plane and don't know where they're going uh, and where they'll land and what they'll be talking about when they get off the plane. So um, what we're sort of trying to do is observe a, a hidden system that's being run by campaign HQs and interacting with voters and interacting with, you know, each other through, uh, we, we, you know, and we're trying to pick up the morsels of data that, that they do leave behind uh, to try and infer what we can about things like what their strategies are, what their prospects um, are in, in particular seats and states, um, what issues they think are salient to voters, what issues they think will, will change voters' um, minds. And that's a really interesting topic that we've been trying to explore around, you know, who are they targeting on certain um, issues? So, you know, where are they going? We've been watching the, the sorts of seats that, that, that these leaders are visiting um, in an attempt to sort of understand where they think they could turn the dial just by their presence being there, by the lo sort of local media coverage that going to a particular area drums up in that particular area. And, you know, we're seeing some seats being visited over and over and over again. I think Parramatta is one of the top list uh, of the list in, in Western Sydney at the moment. Um, the Prime Minister, that is a Labour-held seat at the moment, the Prime Minister, though, is on the offensive there, has gone back over and over and over again. I think it's five visits through this campaign so far, which is a, a quite a lot in just, you know, a four-week period. We're seeing, you know, perennial seats we often see really closely fought bass in northern Tasmania where both leaders have been visiting uh, quite a lot we're seeing a lot of seats in Queensland getting getting special treatment from um, the leaders so that's kind of one part of what I'm doing but then the other thing we're doing is really trying to uncover as more and more campaigning becomes digital there is obviously more of a digital trail that we can start to hoover up and um, look at we have a better clearer idea of how uh, digital ads are being targeted um, this year uh, compared to previous elections through some of the transparency tools that you know the social platforms are um uh, have deployed and are allowing us to to use uh, i'm sure, sure dan, dan will talk about later that is still quite frustrating we're still not getting you know the, the best of uh clearest of ideas but it is painting us a picture of an election that is being fought on a number of different fronts in a number of different ways in a number of different areas and we're sort of seeing a clear picture of um the the Liberal Party and the Prime Minister targeting suburban seats, out of suburban seats and regional areas. We're seeing uh, the the Nationals, the the other party in the coalition, uh, targeting well, particularly targeting Northern Australia and Queensland to try and hold on to the seats that they already hold um, up there. But we're seeing Barnaby Joyce, for example, going back there over and over and over again. Um, and then we're seeing this other dynamic that is emerging, has been emerging over, you know, multiple cycles, but I think is really biting the government this time around, around how they target um, their messages to different constituencies uh, in that, that don't necessarily see eye to eye. You know, the voters of inner, inner Eastern Sydney don't have the same views on the importance and salience of climate change as, say, voters in North Queensland, where, um, you know, their very employment uh, depends on, you know, the, the the sort of existing power sources we have, fossil fuels continuing, um, or at least, you know, there is, you know, competing interests there for different voters, which would traditionally be both, you know, those areas, both traditionally very safe um, for the government, but we're seeing the sort of splits in, in the party there. And I guess just I'm nearing five minutes. So just to wrap up, the, the other thing we're really trying to watch is the salience of issues, voter opinion and watching opinion polls and trying to do a better job, I think, than perhaps um, some uh, reporting of polls was three, 
years ago where people were sort of taken by surprise at the result and how it was discordant with the polls. And yes, there was definitely a polling miss. There was a, a quite a sizable polling miss, historically very large polling miss. Um, but I think there was probably some overconfidence in polling numbers uh, and the way they were used three years ago. So we've been working on a polling average model trying to um, really get that aggregated picture of the polls and what they're they're telling us. So the, you know, the story for, for me for this election has been hoovering up morsels of data to try and understand the dynamics of a campaign, the important issues to voters, the strategies of leaders and, and, and campaigns. Um, but it's very frustrating because we don't get inside the minds of the campaigns. We can only observe uh, bits and bobs and it's imperfect data and it's not representative data at any, at any point. And so um, that makes our job very challenging. Oh, thanks very much, Casey. There's so many good things to pick up on there. Uh, as a as a data analyst, you know, it's just it's um, really intriguing. But um, but for your for the the issues that you're facing at the moment, it must be extremely challenging. So um, so um, we certainly appreciate your time right now, given that it must be a hugely busy time. I'm going to turn now to Mark, and Mark um, Locks is going to actually pick up on the nuances of polling. And so he's going to discuss the targeting of key demographics in marginal seats. And there's been this shift of demographic allegiance to parties over the last four decades. And Mark's going to provide a summary of the spread of voting preferences by demographic group and how and why they would be targeted by pollsters. So Mark's got great credentials for talking about this. He came to QUT after ne nearly two decades in the Queensland state government. And he's been designing courses around policy and politics um, since his arrival at QUT in 2004. So over to you, Mark. So um, for what everyone to remember is, this is a summary of a one hour lecture I give on all the work done by Senator John Black, who analyzes how people voted in elections. So he's looking backwards in all of his analysis. And um, I'm gonna run through it very quickly, but these are generalizations. Number one thing to remember, an issue that you think is really important and will decide how you vote in this election may also be a concern for someone else, but won't change their vote. So, one of the ways to think about how people look at their immediate concerns, the things that will change their vote, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Depending on where you are in that hierarchy, your immediate needs are completely different. So if you're high in the hierarchy and you're financially secure, or you have low expectations, meaning you're a university student and all those expectations about finance are in the future, you can prioritise what are called abstract issues, like climate change, abstract in the sense of it's something in the future that you don't necessarily see the immediate effect of now, we can argue about that, or the needs of others, what Marx called the lumpen proletariat, the unemployed, the disabled, the refugees, people outside of your immediate circle. If you're lower in the pyramid and safety and security are your concerns, mainly because of financial stress, your local community and your family are your number one concerns and your financial survivability is a key factor on how you're going to vote. So it's income versus your debt, think housing. If you're outside the pyramid, if you're religious or you're ideological, you will have views that will still align with these other two points, but there'll be issues that will affect how you vote based upon the beliefs you have in there. So religious groups, for example, may have issues about, um, we don't see them as much in Australia, but in America, you can see debates around abortion, um, education in schools and so forth that would change their vote that wouldn't necessarily affect the other two groups. So who are the party bases based on the recent history? The LNP of the baby boomers. They're the people who have now finally economically stable and they don't want anyone to stuff it up. And they see the LNP as the people that will guarantee that. The nationals have obviously the farmers, but also their electorates are full of transfer payment recipients, people who are on welfare and can't afford to live anywhere else. So they're reliant on their local member representing their needs. And that's why you often see a lot more support for welfare from national party members in some seats. The ALP have shifted from unionized men to unionized women who work in the public sector, tertiary educated women. The Greens, on the other hand, are wealthy women with one or no children and no religion. They are on the top the self-actualization level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay? Who are the swinging voters? Parents. 
they're in the safety zone. They're financially stressed. When I say financially stressed, they're not going broke, but they're thinking about their finances all the time. Mothers think about education. What's the best school? What's going to happen to my kids? Fathers, their fathers voted Labor. They were safe Labor voters because they were employees in unions. That union level dropped from 75% to 13%. These fathers now work for themselves. They're small business people. They're looking for someone who's going to make sure their small business survives and they don't care who it is. Both are looking for long-term economic wealth to be shared with their family. The other swinging voters are the tertiary educated women, turn towards labor, can be green, but the game changer is poor economic management. This is only a small proportion of these women, but in the past, they have changed their vote if they don't think the party they were going to vote for was going to be responsible. Carl Rove, a lot of people go, oh my God, Carl Rove. Carl Rove got this man elected as president twice. He's a goddamn genius. He knows his shit. So you should listen to him, okay? His rules, don't desert your base. Remember that previous slide. Charlie, you're advertising to the customer needs and interests of the people you're looking at. Ensure that you target issues that will affect the person's voting intentions and not just their concerns. Um, social media allows algorithmic targeting to an individual level. He was dealing with things in a pre-internet age in very analog terms when he started. It was physical letters out to people, whereas now, as he says, you can do things that were unimaginable back then. And ultimately, when it gets down to it, only swinging voters in marginal seats matter. That's where you put all your effort. And that's what we actually saw in the conversation about where the politicians are. So very rushed, but that's my profile of voters. Oh, thanks, Mark. That's um, very intriguing, very interesting. And I think everybody who was listening was trying to put themselves somewhere in that in those categories. So it's, um, it's, it um, will open up a lot of um, discussion, I'm sure. Okay, I'm going to turn now to, to Daniel Angus. So Dan's um, going to talk about tracking social media activity during the elections. So Dan uh, has great credentials to talk about this. He's a professor in digital communication in the School of Communication, and he's the leader of Computational Communication and Culture uh, Program in QUT's Digital Media Research Centre. So more, for more than a decade, researchers in this um, centre have been sophi developed sophisticated computational approaches to gather, process and analyse political material shared via the digital platforms. And these now play a significant role in modern elections. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dan. Thanks so much, Kerry, and, and everyone else for your opening comments. Um, so yeah, we've got a strong interest and a strong history in doing work around elections and particularly the role of social media. So within DMRC, we have um, some of the world's foremost experts in understanding how social media impacts our communication spaces. So within elections, it's particularly interesting how um, social media platforms play a role. And social media platforms can play a role in a number of ways. So there is the material that we ourselves as citizen, uh, the citizenry share on social media that may be political in nature. So me sharing my thoughts and views on climate change or active transport or whatever it might be for anyone out there that's listening. And so that's the kind of what we often consider the small p political. So it's that kind of politically adjacent communication that is out there just generally circulating. And that doesn't happen just during elections, but it certainly amplifies during an election campaign. And then you get the kind of the big P political material. So this is stuff that's sent from candidates themselves, from you know, registered political parties and, and think tanks and others that are kind of directly related to, say, policy or that kind of voting ambition um, and, and they're then trying to kind of win your vote and win you over. And so within DMRC, we kind of study a bit of both, right? We're interested in primarily how parties and, and candidates position themselves. So how are they selling and packaging their message across a various platforms. The platforms we tend to look at a lot are Twitter because there is good data access for Twitter. It has an API that allows us to gather that data. Um, at the moment, members, so um, led by uh, one of our um, senior lecturers, um, Asan Deegan, um, is gathering a list of candidates. So once the roles are in and all the candidates are declared for the various parties, we go about actually tabulating a list of those candidates um, and trying to get that there so we can monitor their social media activity. 
We're also then tracking not just what they're saying on Twitter, but how people are tagging them. So on Twitter as a platform, you can direct tweets at other people on the platform. And so we collect that data as well. We tend to just focus on that and not at say more general hashtags like OzPoll, because by looking at the candidates themselves, you get, I think, a much more nuanced view of how they themselves are positioning their candidacy, but also how the, the, those members of their electorates are targeting them and how those local views and, and such might be there. Whereas kind of OzPoll and these hashtags are a bit more of a kind of a, a big gigantic pot of soup, right? Where it can be a bit more difficult to use that and infer you know, attitudes and opinions because of some of what Mark was saying, um, you're getting a much more kind of melange of, of different views and demographics. On Facebook, we rely on Facebook's own um, intelligence analytics platform, CrowdTangle. Um, and Facebook in the years has kind of ebbed and flowed in terms of data access. So it used to be a lot easier to get data out of Facebook, but they've slowly kind of shut the doors. And this brings me to then the other kinds of materials that we do look at, which is advertising. So as advertising has grown in terms of its role within elections, we've tried to develop our own methods and approaches to try to understand how that is also playing a role aside from just that organic activity that I was talking about. And within this, it seems like it's incredibly difficult to get any kind of um, detail of that ads in terms of the spend, in terms of how they're being targeted, because on various platforms, Google's um, platforms, Meta's platforms, um, these ads can be targeted in very, very different and distinct ways. So you can target based on characteristics like um, age, gender, um, location. You can also target around general interest areas. So people who like this particular music or this particular food. Um, and so within that mix, we've seen the impact of ad targeting in other kinds of political contests. The Brexit um, vote, Trump's election um, and how micro-targeting of ads can play a significant role in tailoring those messages down, exactly what was being said there around like some of Rove's strategy about that micro-targeting. What we've been missing though is the ability for us as independent researchers to understand that and actually track that and see how that spend is being directed and understood. Thanks to some sustained pressure, we're starting to get the platforms to open up a little bit around this. So Facebook have an ad transparency library now um, that shows across all of Meta's products. So Facebook, Instagram, and the like. With Google, they also provide political transparency um, tools. But the problem with these is they only give out a tiny, tiny amount of data. We don't get necessarily down to the level of postcode, for example, on Facebook. We just get at the level of state. And we know that there's going to be very massive strategy difference in terms of, for example, how Labor are going to be selling their green credentials in the inner city of Brisbane, but are going to be all pro coal when it comes to Rockhampton. And so you won't see that if all you get is a state-based aggregation. So we launched this um, project through the um, Center of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making in Society, and it's called the Australian Ad Observatory. And what we're doing is trying a different approach. Rather than rely on the platforms themselves to give us the data or data access, we're empowering the citizenry themselves to kind of act and, and use a form of what we call surveillance, which is us kind of watching back up, right, at the big platforms. So the idea here is that as you scroll through your... Um, your own Facebook feed, it will detect this little plugin if you um, download and install it here, um, will detect any sponsored content. And it sends it to a server that we control. So we have access to be able to see all the ads that are donated by the people who've downloaded this plugin. So to date, we've had um, almost 1500. If you want to be that 1500 um, downloaded and get in there quick because um, we'd love to see um, that happen. But um, so about those 1500 people who've downloaded and installed this are donating ads. Where this goes there's into this um, dashboard that we've created. So we can use this to siphon and do things like we're using machine learning to do things like political logo detection. So with all the ads, because it doesn't just get the political ads, it gets any ads that you see in Facebook. Um, we can use this kind of machine learning and, and uh, machine vision to filter out those that include logos. So you can see here, we've seeded it with UAP, um, Liberal, Labor, and the Greens. And what we're getting here is all of the ads that have been donated by members of um, 
our, our kind of participant group, our data donators um, out there. And this gives us the ability now to kind of observe back on the platform and, and try and find if there are ads out there that aren't disclosed properly by the platforms that aren't captured in those tools. But more than that, it gives us much more detailed information about who saw this ad. So we ask people to give some anonymous detail around their demographic data. Um, and so within any of these, we can see um, how many times these ads have been seen and by whom. So underneath this, there's a huge amount of data about you know, where the ad was seen, how it was targeted, um, and you know, a number of information that's not necessarily visible um, within Facebook's own tools. And we can use this to kind of bring about a, another degree of kind of observability on the activities around elections. So look, I'll leave it there and um, but welcome anyone to, to join up to the Ad Observatory um, if you're interested in this. And um, yeah, pass back to you, Kerry. Well, thanks very much, Dan. So yeah, I'm looking forward to joining up and, um, and contributing to that. And it's a very interesting to see what you do with this kind of um, you know, data and, um, and how that is actually being, um, being assessed and, and used. Okay, I'm going to now turn to Misha. Um, so Misha is um, going to be talking about um, polls and traffic whoring. Um, so how numbers can be the enemy of good election journalism. So we're going to flip the conversation a little bit here. Misha can do this. He's the editor of The Conversation Australia and New Zealand, and he's been an editor and journalist for more than 25 years. So he's going to explore how polls can be toxic to election coverage and why traffic is a bad metric in journalism. So hopefully this will inspire some discussion after, after he's finished. I'll hand over to you, Misha. Uh, thanks very much, Kerry. And um, also thank you, Daniel, for that presentation. I'm really interested in the um, Australian Ad Observatory. Actually, it'd be very useful for some of the work we're doing. Um, I should start by saying that at the conversation, we have a rule, which is that um, academics need to disclose any conflicts of interest when they write articles. And I think by way of perhaps declaring a potential conflict of interest, I should tell you a little bit about what I was thinking about when I was preparing my remarks for this um, panel. And I was thinking about what I might call it. And first I thought I should call it why I detest data. And then I thought maybe that's a little bit strong. And then I thought maybe I could call it um, descent into data hell. Maybe I could call it data and the death of democracy, or maybe I could call it data is distortion. Um, and in actual fact, they're all things that to some extent I do believe. Now, I, I want to say with some sort of, you know, clarity that obviously data can do some very valuable things for us and it has uses. I think in the political realm, it's influence is almost entirely problematic um, all the way through from beginning to end. Um, and I'm just going to talk about two ways in which it's problematic, just starting with um, the practical reality of the way in which the news media works and the way that data functions in newsroom. Um, as you all know, journalists are under incredible pressure um, to do a job which is a public interest job serving democracy, covering the key issues. They're also under another type of pressure, which is a pressure to deliver audiences um, for commercial operations and also even for public broadcasters um, to deliver a certain amount of eyeballs or audience numbers. That pressure can become incredibly intense when you're being measured, not just by what you do generally, but by particular specific articles. I mean, there are software programs that will literally tell you how well your article does if it's in a certain spot on a web page and that, and that sort of thing. There was some Research done recently, it was a book written in the, in the US that became an article in the, in the Neiman lab that was talking about an experiment run by Gorka. And Gorka ran this experiment where they got some of their staff to do what they called um, very tellingly traffic whoring, which was this idea of actually producing articles that are just going to chase audiences, as opposed to the proper work of sort of public interest journalism, which is producing articles that will inform the public or serve democracy. Um, and they did this work and they, they did this experiment about the way it works and sort of treating this thing separately to sort of try to deal with the fact that journalists are under this constant pressure to chase audiences. And I just wanna read you a little bit from the article that was written about this, because I think it really um, goes to an important question. Um, they said, metrics confront journalists with a powerful mixed message. If they ignore traffic data altogether, 
they risk being seen as foolishly obstinate, patronising towards their audience and behind the times, behind the digital times. In effect, guaranteeing their professional obsolescence and possibly facing managerial censure or even job loss. But if journalists rely on metrics too much, they risk corrupting their sense of professional integrity and autonomy and potentially sullying their reputation. Now, I think one of the interesting things to think about in this context is, for example, I get every day um, a, a set of numbers, which are Google trend numbers, what people are searching and what people are thinking and talking about. I could use those numbers to dictate the coverage that I do, but it would be a huge distortion in terms of the role of covering the election. Um, the best read article on the conversation is an article called How Long Does Sex Normally Last? written by an academic expert. It's been read almost 15 million times. Um, we've been doing a particular project looking at Wentworth um, with focus groups in this election. That article has been read 14,700 times. Um, you can get a sense of the magnitudes of difference um, in terms of what is actually going to attract traffic and what isn't going to attract traffic. If you allow that to influence your decision making, your capacity to um, serve the public interest, to identify what voters need to know and give them that information is severely compromised. So I would say that in a general sense, that data in the newsroom is really problematic. Um, the second way in which data is problematic, and I think we all saw this in the 2019 election, is the use of polls. Um, there's a really terrific a journalism academic from the US called Jay Rosen, um, who actually came out to Australia and spoke to staff at the ABC. I was working at the ABC at the time in 2010. And he basically said, the problem with political journalism is that we call politics like a horse race. We talk about who's up and who's down and who's winning and who's losing. And that distracts us from doing the important job of actually hosting the policy discussion. How are we going to address climate change? How are, we going to, how are we going to address the cost of living? How are we going to make sure that we have a fair taxation system? Really dealing with those substantial questions. And he, he gave an example um, which related to, um, there was a policy announced about people who were suffering from, um, who were dealing with um, the challenges of, of disability in the 2010 election. Um, and basically the government had put some money towards this. And, Jay Rosen said, look, all of the coverage just talked about what this policy was going to mean in terms of the number of votes in given seats. But nobody talked about whether it was a good policy for people with, with a disability or a bad policy. Nobody actually addressed the substantive issues themselves. So the problem with polls is not that we need better polls, although the polls were clearly wrong in 2019. The problem is actually polls displace the important conversation. They are a distraction they displace the actual work of the election itself. And the more time we spend looking at polls and obsessing about polls, the less time we spend actually doing the work of having the conversations that we need to have. Um, so from my point of view as an editor, um, we do, we do some, some work trying to um, consult with our audience and find out what issues are on their minds and um, things like the ABC's Vote Compass do that work as well. We use that work to try to help us identify the issues but then what we want to do is really try to steer away from looking at the data who's up who's down who's winning who's losing and actually focus on that conversation about the things that really matter um, yeah so from my point of view uh, data is a distraction it is problematic and although it's got things that that can make it useful I think it's something that we just need to keep in its proper place I'm going to stop there uh, thank you very much, Misha. That's um, a lot of food for thought, and, uh, and and I think it's really important for us to be considering. I mean, data can be a distraction if we're looking in the wrong spot, or or we're trying to 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 use it to the wrong uh, for the wrong purpose. And so, I think it's a really um, important and sobering um, comments there. Okay, that brings us to the end of the um, the 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 um, the perspectives of each of the panel members, and we're going to just come into question time now. So I'm going to um, to start with a a question actually of Misha. So Misha, you've talked about polls, and you've you've talked about the pitfalls of polls, and um, and the pitfalls of using data in this way. So if you could dream up something to replace this kind of system that we have now, what would it be? Well, I wouldn't try to get better polls because I think polls actually are a problem in themselves. Like even if they were more accurate, 
it's still a problem, right? We know that the polls are bad in any individual seat. We know that individual seat polling is next to worthless. We know that the polls in the 2019 election were bad more generally. Um, but there is this sort of culture of trying to treat all our audiences and everybody as though we're all savvy party strategists and bring us to the inside of this, oh, well, this is going to play well in this seat and this is going to work that way. And, uh, you know, I just think that the whole the whole process of talking and thinking that way distracts us from saying, what do we want to do as a society and, and what are the issues that matter? So I'm not sure that polls are solvable and I'm not quite sure that, um, you know, in my view, like I wouldn't necessarily be wanting to put a massive amount of, of effort and time into perfecting the polls. I think that the important thing is we change our attitude to them and how we treat them and use them only really as a guide. One of the other things actually that was really been noted is that in Australian politics, the polling is consistent and constant in a way it's not in many other countries. And that has a huge distortionary effect on our politics as well, like in terms of the, the, the turnover of leaders, the capacity of actually politicians getting things done, because we're always having this conversation about these numbers. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's a solution is my short answer. Okay, thanks. Um, would anybody else like to pick up yeah. on that? Sure, just quickly. Um... I completely agree with what Misha is saying. And I would add that I think the average person looking at how they're going to vote doesn't let the polls influence what they do. Because as Misha was saying, the conversation is part of that Canberra bubble or the Brisbane bubble or the Melbourne bubble, and depending on which state or federal election is going on. It's something that they talk about. What astounds me too all the time is the complete lack of understanding on the part of many of the political um, commentary of how polls work. And ideas that a national poll is a, a decider of um, who's going to win when, if say for example, Labor went up 5%, but that entire 5% was in safe Labor seats, the outcome doesn't change. So it's a complete misnomer. And that conversation, as Misha says, is not just misunderstood by the people who are watching from the outside, but I don't even think it's understood by the people who are commentating from the inside. Okay, thanks. Dan, yeah. would you like to pick up yeah. on that? I mean, it comes down to a principle we, we talk about and I teach in information visualization, which is really about the importance of data stories and narrativization. And what a lot of the time happens is you get a vacuum, you get some data and you get some people who think they understand maybe how to read that and interpret that or even how they can weaponize that. So you look at the way that certain polling is weaponized, particularly in more kind of conservative leaning media to kind of drive the story. So the polling is rather than just a reflection of an attitude is seen as a, as a driver of attitudes. And so that's part of the problem as well, is this kind of lack of data narrativization and understanding of that. And I think it's a warning sign for those of us who deal with data in the political realm to make sure that we are always kind of attuned to that and including narratives in what we're doing to actually help not just provide, hey, here are some numbers we've collected, but here's a narrative and here's a way you, you should interpret this and be wary of anyone that tries to offer an alternative um, interpretation, which, which strays too far from the you know, notional truth that, that situates here. I do think uh, in general terms, the polling industry has moved, uh, sorry, the, the, the media industry has moved in a healthy direction when it comes to polling. I think, uh, well, A, a lot of the pollsters took a break after the 2019 election. We actually saw about a dearth of polling for about six to 12 months. Uh, and that kind of helped as the pollsters really rethought some of their methods. They've all come back. They're trying, you know, all of them are actually trying slightly new things this time. It means we've got a sort of healthier spread of polling this time around. And I do think, by and large, the, the sort of media industry as a whole has uh, moved to a more responsible, healthy way of reporting those polls. We still see shockers. I'm not pretending that at all. We still see polling weaponized by um, commentators and by columnists. We still see some of those um, issues, but I do think there has been an improvement and an improved understanding of what those polls are. And the other thing I think that, that we're seeing is a much greater commitment to actually disclosure of what's going on with polls, how they're operated, who's commissioning them. Uh, and we've seen some really important steps with the formation of a polling council by the pollsters, which is requiring some um, extra disclosure around uh, how they conduct them. So we can understand as reporters and members of the public and analysts can understand, you know, what's actually going into these polls, not in perfect detail, but in better detail than we've ever seen um, before. And, you know, to the point of, do we Get rid of polling do we end polling i think you're never going to um you're never going to see polling completely disappear uh the parties are going to be using polling uh you know it, it's just sort of an unavoidable 
um, oh my, sorry, my camera's been off this whole time. Um, I didn't even realize, um, <laughs> apologies. Uh, you're never gonna see um, polling completely kind of, you know, vacate, but there are more responsible ways that we can use that polling certainly. And I think we are, we're, we're taking those uh, steps and ultimately, you know, I think we still do need to have some way of understanding public opinion. You know, journalists themselves are a um, a narrow segment of the population. They do not, you know, the class of journalists is not a representative, uh, does not have, uh, you know, a full, you know, journalists do not look like real Australia is like what I'm trying to say. We need some way of understanding um, what, people in different parts of the country truly believe and unfortunately polling is the least worst way of doing that maybe i can just jump in on that because i think that's that's right to an extent but the problem with polling is that it asks the wrong question the question that polling tells you the answer to is who's ahead right at this moment um you know in terms of who people are going to vote for and then people try to use that as a predictor of who's going to win now in a way like what difference does it make we're going to find out when we find out it's like that feverish speculation you get about when the government's going to set an election date and everyone's like, oh, when's the election going to be? Well, the moment that we know what it is, actually, it's not, it's not consequential. It's just literally the media has this amazing fascination with knowing things first or predicting things. Predicting, in my view, isn't a game that we should be in. Like, I don't think actually it's useful. I don't think our predictive capacities are actually that good. I don't think it's that important. Um, and I think when Casey says it, it, it's a... It's a good way of understanding, um, you know, people's views, you know, the, the views of the population. I think that is a really strong and valid point. The only thing I'd say is that the polling tends to be much more about, do you like this leader? Do you not? Do you like Labor? Do you not? Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? It actually doesn't tend to tell us anything really meaningful or nuanced about how people feel about, you know, our education system or health or, you know, the substantive issues that actually we need to know about to play a productive role in our democracy in terms of getting better outcomes. So I'm still not sure even in terms of that measure, like it's somewhat useful, but when you look at how much it's weaponized, how often it's used to try to depose a leader or to spin something a certain way or to provide support for somebody's political ideological beliefs or arguments, you know, if you said to me, you know, would we be better with polls or without polls? I think on the balance of evidence, you'd have to say they're actually pretty destructive. But even with the knowledge that party actors will be continuing to use polls and, you know, they're doing 10 times as much polling as we see in the public sphere, that's never going away, you know, yeah. even if all the, all the newspapers are reading the commission um, again. Can I just um, add, ask a question about this then, Casey? So, so you, you're talking about this, but, but from your perspective then, um, what are some of the biggest challenges you face as a journalist in trying to communicate about data in general, not just about polls, but about data in general? And, and how how do you do it? Uh, the big question. Um, I think, look... The, in in the about, key, you know, two minutes. In, in, two, in less than two minutes. The key um, difficulty I think we have uh, whenever we talk about data in, in media, and it's, a, it's exemplified by the way polls are reported, is, is uncertainty and understanding um, when our estimates are estimates, how good are those estimates? And I think that's something that we've seen improvement in. I think there's still a ways to go when it comes to opinion poll reporting. I think we've seen some steps in the right direction. Um, it's what we're trying to do rather than, you know, looking at any particular opinion poll when it comes to voting intention, uh, looking at the trend line rather than looking at an individual poll. Because I think that's where some of the destructive stuff comes from. I think um, it is valuable. I do think it's valuable for us to understand over the course of a year, if all of the polls are consistently saying one thing and they're consistently trending in the same direction, I do think that's useful for us to understand. It can be used in the wrong ways, but I do think it's useful. Um, but it's about us understanding and us correctly communicating what we actually know, what, what data is telling us, and most importantly, what it's not telling us. And I think that's often where we fall down. Um, you know, headlines need to be simple. Headlines need to be really straightforward. Um, headlines always need to be the sort of most interesting eye-grabbing thing. And uncertainty in data is rarely eye-grabbing or, you know, and so that's always the challenge that, that, that we have. We've had, the, you know, the same challenge with the, with the pandemic. Um, we've got all of these uh, numbers coming in and they're all estimates, you know, case numbers are estimates, death numbers are estimates, all of that. 
how can we truly understand and communicate what we really don't know? And I think that's where we all, as reporters working with data, need to get better, um, is thinking about that uncertainty and how we um, how we make sure we're not misleading our audiences and our readers by leading them to conclusions, whether advertently or inadvertently, that, that aren't stacked up. I had just another thing about this. There's two types of polling that we need to talk about. We're talking about the one type of polling we're seeing about making predictions. There's another type of polling used by political parties and other groups as well to see whether they can change how people will vote. They want to see if they can put forward an idea very much like advertising. Would you change your vote if we were to say blah? I was actually, uh, 15 years ago, I uh, used to go to a lot of those polling sessions and one party was running polls on what does a good foreign affairs minister look like? <laughs> Not to that level of cynicism. But that sort of polling isn't published for the rest of us to see. But that is the polling that ties into Dan's side of the argument. And that's what leads, yeah, this is a link to me to get back to, the, to Dan's. But um, that polling drives the advertising that Dan's trying to map. And um, I've got a question for Dan. This is a Dorothy Dixon, by the way. I don't know what social media, the different groups I described actually use. So I'd love to hear from Dan, if he could give us a quick rundown of, you know, what, what a baby boom is used, what are the different groups used? Yeah, for yeah. sure. And it, it's changing all the time. So Facebook has a particularly older demographic attached to it now. And in fact, they had a historic moment recently where they actually declined their user base for the first time in their, in their long history. Um, youth are abandoning that platform. There's no, no bones about it that Facebook is lacking appeal to a youth audience who are now more than ever taking up newer platforms like TikTok, for example. Instagram's kind of holding the middle between those two. So when I say older, it's not necessarily just boomers. We, we, you know, there's a, there's kind of a, a peak through that kind of, you know, 40s and, and, and you know, kind of mid 30s market as well there. Um, you've got more of a kind of like the, those in their 20s, mid 20s and such are, are heavy users of Instagram. Um, there are certain platforms that pretty much everybody will go to and use. YouTube's a classic one like that where it has a very wide demographic, um, you know, attached to it. But um, it's interesting in those that you do see demographic changes. And yes, absolutely, the ads will reflect that. Um, there was one case of a Greens candidate here in Brisbane who took out ads on Grindr. Um, which is a social dating service um, and, and social media service um, largely used by gay, um, bi, trans and uh, men who have sex with men. Um, and, you know, on Grindr, it's um, interesting that, you know, this is an openly gay candidate um, and, um, you know, spoke the lingo essentially of that platform, right? So there are ways in which ads can be incredibly authentic um, and, and speak to authentic kind of platform norms and what we call platform vernaculars, the ways in which we use, you know, particular memes or things within those platforms. Um, and there are ways they're done very cringe. And often the cringe happens when you get a mismatch between the audience who are using that platform or indeed the, the politician who's trying to kind of jump in there. And, you know, the, the visual of, if you know the meme of like Steve Buscemi with the, the skateboard over his shoulder going, you know, hello, fellow kids, right? They kind of feel like that. It's, there's a mismatch here between, you know, who, how this person authentically identifies and the platforms that they're going on. Um, but just, I mean, not to go over, over time on this one, I just want to pour cold water on one idea, though, is that even though we are tracking these ads and we're very interested in this space, we see very little, like, hyper-targeting of advertising in Australia. It is nowhere close to what you see in campaigns like what happened with Trump in the States or that. Um, we see, you know, UAP is a classic case of this. They just carpet bomb ads everywhere that are, that are kind of very basic, you know, simplistic messaging, and they just go everywhere and everyone gets the same thing. Um, we see very little, um, tar like, you know, really, really finely targeted messaging. Um, you know, that grinder example is, is one where there's been a bit of that tailoring going on for that particular audience, but very much in Australia, I don't think we see the kind of like really, really deep micro-targeting that happens in other jurisdictions. Why do you think that is? Because we get so many of our polling approaches from the US. Like, why is that taking so long? Look, I think it's got something to do with compulsory voting um, and the nature of campaigns in Australia. So we campaigns target towards swing voters, right? And I mean, you know, within those seats, yes, you might see some tailored messaging or other things going on. Um, 
it, it's just, I mean, the stakes might not be as high in Australia as they are in other places. Um, that, yeah, we, you know, it's not to say it doesn't happen, but it just doesn't happen to the extent that you see and the volume you see in other jurisdictions. It's interesting because I think- Can I in, just ask Ben to, oh, sorry, Nisha, go on. I was going to say, just, I think in one of the slides, I forget who it was, there was a thing from Carl Rove, um, I think that was you, Mark, and it was yeah. talking about don't, don't, um, you know, go against your base. Mm -hmm. um, that's very interesting in the US context, of course, because they don't have compulsory voting and you've got to get out the base. In Australia, it's very different. The traditional wisdom has been that in actual fact, your job is to target the swinging voter in the centre. Yet, what we've seen is the political parties, I mean, sort of moving more towards the, the extreme elements within their within their group. So there's more sort of like hard right dominant states. So let's have an example in the Liberal Party. You see some of that in, in the ALP. I, I sort of wonder why that's happening if in a country with compulsory voting where they're supposed to be going after the centre. Well, what's actually happening to both parties? No one wins government without 40% primary vote and neither party has it this time and neither party's close because they're moving towards the centre and they're losing their people off the back end. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the sky at night people are leaving the LNP and the National Party. The the Greens are, are just gutting the tail end of the Labor Party. And they need to scare them back, to be blunt. Um, and part of the message is those extremists can't supply the answer that you want. But I need to get your attention. And that's how I read a lot of the things you're talking about. Can I ask Mark for you then, um, just coming to a different demographic and it, and it speaks to what, um, what Dan was talking about as well. Um, in talking with your students uh, around uh, data and about data and elections, do you, how do students see the, the new importance of data and why, why do we need to be more data literate, do you think? Um, the number one reply from students is, is there an election on? Um, that's where we're sitting. The other thing that has shocked me, a really amazing shift in attitude from uh, an assumption effectively of everyone in the classroom voting Green and right-wing students voting Labor to no, that's not true anymore by any stretch. There's an even spread. It's not that there's a majority of people in the current university age bracket who become conservative, but they're there and you can see them and they have something to say. When I went to university in the 80s, I was talking to the guy who led the South Brisbane branch of the Liberal Party and the South Brisbane branch ran from the Brisbane River to the New South Wales border. That was the level of conservative participation in university. That's no longer true. And I can see Dan nodding as well. Are you seeing the same? It's interesting. I think I'm not, I'm not as convinced it's not due to demographic change in terms of who's going to university, but, you know, certainly there are some, there are some faulty assumptions out there, I think. And particularly we see this on the platforms and, and what you see on the pla like different platforms when you go looking for it. Um, I mean, there's a massive fragmentation of news audience. I might go to Casey on this one. I mean, Casey, like within ABC as well, um, I've done some interviews for Hack and, you know, you kind of assume that, yeah, perhaps through, you know, Triple J and that you're still going to reach a youth audience. But how do you see, like, with, with what you do personally and, and, and within that team, how do you kind of get at that broad audience in terms of getting these messages out there? Yeah, you know, I mean, audiences are more and more and more and more fragmented. Um, and we, you know, we see a real divide in like our television audience versus our digital audience versus our radio audience versus programs like um, hack you can see when you do the audience sort of um, surveys when you look at the sort of ratings data that we have you can see and 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 you know young people are not going to the seven o'clock um, news anymore so our, I think our challenge often as reporters is we've got more and more and more places that we need to sort of reach audiences when we have a story it's about finding um, the best treatment of that story for a particular audience and even deciding which audience actually cares about the story. You know, if it's a story about youth allowance, well, there's not a lot of point, frankly, running it on the seven o'clock news because there are very few 18 year olds. Um, having said that, you know, that's a blunt example. There are of course reasons that older, older viewers should care about um, issues affecting young people, but you know, you need to think about those sorts of, um, uh, you know, those sorts of, um, factors and you know i think the other to your point mark about Earl, um you know is there an election on i think if we were traffic whoring um truly traffic whoring and only only um 
sort of publishing stories that that got the most eyeballs, we probably wouldn't have covered the election for the first couple of weeks of the campaign because people don't turn on. I don't know what your, you know, our audience data is, you know, pretty poor, frankly, for the first, <laughs> first you know, comparatively other stories are, are, are much more in people's minds than the federal election campaign. Now that will change in the last week or two of the, the campaign as people kind of, you know, as pre-polling starts, people start casting votes, that, that absolutely will change. We'll have a very big audience on the weekend of the election. Um, that's the, the general pattern, at least. But, um, uh, you know, sometimes there is a real balance for us to work out what uh, what issues are in the public interest. How do we tell those stories in ways that are going to attract eyeballs? Because there is no point in us doing journalism that no one reads. So how do we then find those issues and tell them in the way that... Um, people are actually going to be engaged with and you know we have audience data that the point is to you know for the abc at least the point is for us to use the audience data we've got the audience feedback the audience response that we've got to try and inform the best ways of telling public interest stories um and i forget the third point i was going to make but i'll, I'll leave it there okay casey can i just um just in the interests of time then just in um in say you know half a minute just talk about what kind of data would be best for you? What what would you see as um, the what sort of forms of data would be most useful for you? So uh, look, I've been really interested in the social. You know, as 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 election campaigns um, move online, they become you know traditionally you know you'd see mass TV advertising, radio advertising, newspaper advertising. Uh, people would turn on the the news at six o'clock or five o'clock or seven o'clock every night, and, and that would be their day's news. Um, all in one package. It would come from the the campaign trail, you know, following the leaders around uh, on buses and planes. Um, increasingly, campaigning is moving digital, which makes it harder for us to see. Um, and that's important. It, I think it's important. That's why the work Dan's doing is so important, I think, around trying to uncover that because um, it is actually, you know, the, the the campaigns don't want us to see all of the messaging that goes out there. It is in the public interest for us to understand what they're telling and for, the, for that kind of to be exposed publicly um, so that we can see where they are running different lines to different audiences, where they are potentially skirting the lines of mis and disinformation. And we've seen a bit of that in this campaign uh, targeted at particular uh, groups, targeted at particular um, electorates. So the more transparent that could be, the better a, an idea uh, of where the hidden kind of campaign is, I think um, that's the sort of biggest thing that I'd like to see more of uh, in, in, in modern campaigning. There's another data set that I think is really fascinating that drives so much of the strategies of campaigns that we haven't mentioned once, and that's the direct voter contact databases that political parties have, um, particularly the major parties, but all parties are, uh, you know, the most powerful thing they have is the information they have about individual voters. They will call people they will door knock people. And then when that interaction with the voter is done, they will take notes on that person and store it in their central database. Um, the parties are exempt from the Privacy Act. We have no idea what they have on us. We have no idea how they're using it. We have no idea what other data sources they might be augmenting that with from other sources. Um, and it is, I, I suspect, the most important um, data set in an election campaign. Uh, and we just really don't understand how they're using it. Um, that is something I'd really like to see more um, in the open. It's not gonna happen, but you know, it's a really important piece of how data is used in campaigns that we have zero visibility on. Oh, thanks very much, Casey. So in the interest of time, we, we have to wrap this up. Um, we, we could go on for, for a lot longer, um, but we started this conversation with a comment about that we need different kinds of discussions, like the ones that we've had today in order to make, to be able to make better decisions based on data and to increase our data literacy. We need to become more data literate as we engage with important issues like the elections. And I know I've learned a lot from the discussion today. And I want to thank all of the panellists for your time, your considered opinions and your advice on data science in the news. And I'd like to thank Casey, Mark, Daniel and Misha. And also Becky Cook and Tim McCougar from the QUT Centre for Data Science for all your help in organising and promoting the Data Science in the News webinar. So finally, thanks to you, our audience, and from the Centre for Data Science, take care and bye for now. <laughs>